Hi, welcome to another episode of Five Good Thoughts. Today we welcome Ben Simpson, uh, Assistant Director of Spiritual Formation here at Truett Seminary. Welcome, Ben. Hey, thanks, Jack. Glad you're here. Ben is here to talk with us about pastoral wisdom for anxiety and depression. And uh, he's offering this kind of uh, seminar or, or talk, I don't know how to phrase it really, uh, uh, to our students here at Truett. And, and it's fun and, uh, to think about in the greater scope of the world, this is a conversation we need to be having among pastors, ministers, church people. Um, just everybody's got this on the tip of their, their tongue and on, fresh on their mind. So uh, glad that we could have you to have this conversation. And so without much uh, more ado, Ben, take it away. What's number five as we think about pastoral wisdom for anxiety and depression? Right. Hey, before I launch off and I, I, I give you uh, number five, I'll just say that it, it's my privilege to be here. Thank you, Jack. I'm glad to be here. And, and also, I do hope that these thoughts are five good thoughts, even on a topic that's as challenging as uh, caring for people who are suffering with anxiety and depression. So thought number five, it, it's, it's foundational, I think, for all of the Christian life. And it's, it's God is good. Um, in Exodus 34, 6, God passed us before Moses, and he says, The Lord, the Lord God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion and faithfulness. And this description of God is picked up elsewhere in the Bible, in Psalm 86, 103, 145, Joel 2, elsewhere. Uh, why is this a foundational thought for uh, caring for people who are suffering uh, with anxiety and depression? For two reasons. One is to help sustain people who are passing through it. And then secondly, for church leaders, it's also something that we want to make sure that we impart to our people because um, it's a fallback. If you pass through hardship and you have a deep and abiding conviction that God is good, then even though you might not have a felt sense of that in the moment, mm -hmm. you do have something that you will say, but I profess this to be true. Uh, so remembering that God is good uh, is step one any time that you're either counseling somebody or you yourself might be passing through anxiety and depression. Yeah, that's really good. I think, and, and I could be wrong about this, but I think that's the most repeated phrase about the character of God throughout the Old Testament, mm -hmm. is the slow to anger, abounding in compassion. Uh, and, and that's an important factor, I think, as we, we launch into this discussion. So, mm -hmm. number four, keep it going. All right, number four is hardships are real. So... <laughs> When people find themselves in a place either that they are, uh, are experiencing anxiety that's associated or born of worry, or they find themselves in a place of uh, being depressed, uh, it's important to remember that uh, hardships are real. Now, the fallen world that we exist in, being what it is, it's going to bring tough times our way. And uh, the hardships that we face, uh, they do present us with opportunities to grow in our faith and, and to learn to trust God in ordinary things. Um, in 1 Kings 19.5, uh, there's a small uh, statement there that's made uh, about Elijah and how God tells him to get up and eat. And meditating on that verse of scripture uh, in My Utmost for His Highest on February 17, just to give you the date, Oswald Chambers, he writes this, he says, God simply told Elijah to do a very ordinary thing, that is to get up and eat. If we were never depressed, we would not be alive. Only material things don't suffer depression. If human beings were not capable of depression, we would have no capacity for happiness and exaltation. Whenever you examine yourself, always take into account your capacity for depression. When the Spirit of God comes to us, He does not give us glorious visions, but He tells us to do the most ordinary things imaginable. Depression tends to turn us away from the everyday things of God's creation, but whenever God steps in, his inspiration is to do the most natural, simple things, things we would never have imagined God was in, but as we do them, we find him there. So if the scriptures tell us to expect hardship and our tra tradition reminds us that trials and tribulations will come, just acknowledging the reality that we can expect suffering in this life and that God can sustain and refine us in and through our hardships can bolster us up whenever we become depressed or anxious. So I, I guess the question there is why Why do you think, and this uh, is our maybe cultural Christianity or the climate of, of Christianity, um, want to deny hardship? 
because that does seem to be prevalent uh, mm-hmm. through through some of our experiences of church and, and that sort of thing where they just it's dismissed and, and and that sort of thing. Why do you think that happens? And and how do how does acknowledging hardship is, that are real help that? Mm-hmm. Well, it's been observed that American culture in particular might be the worst culture in all of world history when it comes to preparing people for the realities of suffering. Now from our location here, we're recording this in Waco, Texas, and for most of the people that we're around, just the reality that if you are a human being, that sometimes things are gonna get tough. For people that grow up here where we have so much prosperity, that is a jarring experience, Mm -hmm. and it can rock somebody's faith. For people in other parts of the world, in other circumstances, Maybe they come to learn this more naturally, that suffering and hardship is part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. But for us as pastors, just simply to say, hey, sometimes life is going to get tough. That right there means that when hard times do come, it doesn't completely unsettle us. It instead just helps us say, okay, well, this is one of those tough times. So while I'm in it, where is God? Where am I? And how can I learn to trust and deepen my faith? That's good. Not easy questions uh, to answer. So number three, keep us going right. here. That <laughs> number three, help is available. Yeah. Okay. Now listen, three things to be said on this. Whenever you are leading somebody, whenever you yourself uh, find yourself in a place where you're depressed or where you're anxious, uh, sometimes people feel as though there is no help available. Uh, but for people of faith, I mean, the first thing to say is first, God is a help. So Psalm 70, verses 4 and 5 says, May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. This is a prayer to God. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great, but I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. And so if you find yourself in a place of trouble, the first person that we can turn to for help is God. And I think theologically, I think it's important for us to remember that. As people come to us and as we seek to help them, just say, hey, I want to help you. I want to be with you. Let's also make sure that our life of prayer is directing that plea to God who is there to help us. So that's one big help that we all have. Now, there's a second and a third. Second, uh, medical professionals can assist people. And I think this is important to say. If somebody in our church fellowship is uh, sick, Uh, if they are depressed, if they are anxious. uh, These are medical conditions. And I think care and wisdom is to say, look, we know a lot of things in our tradition and in our fellowship, but we can be assisted by these other fields of knowledge, including people who are doctors. And so counsel people, say, have you talked to your doctor about this? Have you spoken with a physician about this? And it may be the case that they... uh, have some ways they can help you that have nothing to do with medicine and just having to do with taking care of the physical state of one's body. Uh, Depression is a brain injury. Uh, The care for one's health or can refer somebody uh, to places that they need help. That's the second way that help is available. And then third, it's important I think for us to say is that if somebody is depressed and somebody's anxious, um, they have pastors. They have fellow congregants. Uh, There is a spiritual community that can help carry you through. Um, Because one of the most helpful ways to cope with anxiety or depression is if you're feeling anxious to be able to pick up the phone and call and share with a Christian friend, this is how I'm feeling. And that brother or sister say, well, let me pray for you. Uh, The most helpful thing uh, that a person might have who's experiencing these things is to know that there are other people in their life who have care and concern for them. So that third thought is help is available. Yeah. The isolation aspect of, of, of mental health in, in general within congregations, I think it's been a long struggle um, for us to come to grips with well. But the whole idea of Christian community and the, the elimination of isolation seems to be uh, a, a real primacy, a real need for, for these kind of experiences in the, in the moment. How do we do that well? Because... We've all been there, or maybe we've been, I know I've, I've been the one to say dumb things that that can sometimes be more hurtful in the mm-hmm. moment than helpful. Mm-hmm. So how do, we, how do we maintain saying what is helpful and good mm-hmm. uh, and not being 
kind of an, uh, uh, someone that heaps on. Yeah, do no harm. Okay. Yeah. Now, the first thing that's important to say, I think, to anybody who might be listening to this, to say to you, to say to me, is we're going to mess it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, being wise, I think, in the way of Christ uh, is going to require some trial and error. You're going to have to mess up. Uh, now, on the other side of that is you're going to have to have the courage and the boldness to be willing to make a mistake. Now, if you're looking for the helpful things to say, um, you know, look, if somebody's depressed, the answer to their problem is not to say, well, buck up. You know, uh, it's going to get better. It's going to be okay. It's not always the answer. Now, sometimes that's just the kick in the pants somebody needs. Okay, for an anxious person who feels persistently anxious about their, their life and circumstance, just simply to say, well, don't worry about that, you know, that's not always going to be the most helpful thing. In fact, as pastors, sometimes the most helpful thing, I think, for anxiety, and this makes me think of Matthew chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus telling us do not to worry, or do not worry for tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Um, if you actually read the passage, what you're going to find is uh, Jesus is trying to teach us that God is sovereign and that nothing escapes God's notice. And, but that's preparatory, okay? That's learning beforehand when you enter in there that God can be trusted I think the most helpful thing to say to somebody who is passing through suffering is, hey, thank you for sharing that. Um, Can you tell me more? How can I help you? Pray for that person. And then a big step, I think, too, is somebody tells you something hard, you have that conversation, you note it, you pray for it, Uh, make a note every few days just to check in on them, ask how they're doing, be a person who cares. That's really good, yeah. Too often we have the moment conversation and never return to it. and It's in the return that perhaps most uh, beneficial uh, work can be done. So number two, give us some resources that we can uh, grab onto that will help us as we, we walk in this world. Okay, now, you know, when I saw that one of the things we'd get to talk about here would be resources I like, you know, I got really excited because I like books, I like pointing people to things. And I'm going to start by staying on theme, okay? So uh, there's, a, there's a physician named Stephen Ilardi. That last name spelling is I-L-A-R-D-I. And he's written a book called The Depression Cure, The Six-Step Program to Beat Depression Without Drugs, okay? Because I know a lot of people who deal with dep- uh, depression and anxiety. One of their first concerns is, I don't want to be on meds. And meds can be helpful. Meds are good for some people, okay, with the assistance of a, a doctor. Uh, but there are things we can actually do uh, that help our bodies cope with these realities when we face them. And in this book, he, he presents a framework for these things and just says, you know, certain things like omega-3s, uh, taking action over just getting consumed by your thoughts. That's as simple sometimes even of, you know you're kind of in a bad place and you're spiraling. Mm-hmm. as picking up the phone mm-hmm. and talking to a trusted friend just so that it gets out of your head. Um, exercise taking care of your body, Uh, sunlight, so being outside, Uh, having a robust community, people you can lean on tends Mm -hmm. to lessen the burdens you carry, Uh, and then lastly, sleep as a way to combat uh, depression or anxiety without the assistance of uh, uh, drugs. And then a second resource uh, to point people to, and then I'm going to name a third, the second is by J.P. Moreland. And he's written a little little book called Finding Quiet, My Story of Overcoming Anxiety and the Practices that Brought Peace. And this book is one part testimony and advice. It's also one part apologetics for why even to approach these questions as a Christian person, where sometimes people just dismiss these things as emotional things that folks should just put aside and have faith instead. And he introduces a couple of spiritual practices and ways of praying that can bolster a Christian in the Christian life. And a third resource I just want to say, because some people are pastors, read Tom Nelson's The Flourishing Pastor. It's a good book on Christ-like character, on the importance of pastoral leadership, reclaiming the shepherding metaphor for leadership, and then some practical things on how to lead your church. That's really good. All right, we've come to it. Give us the the final good thought. Mm -hmm. The final good thought is healing is possible. Okay, I mean... Just to review here, God is good, hardships are real, help is available, healing is possible. Okay, in John 5, 6, we're told Jesus looked upon a man at the pool of Bethesda and he asked him, do you want to get well? 
And if that's your answer, God can come alongside. And I think for all people, healing might come in degrees for some. Mm -hmm. It might be an ongoing struggle that's lifelong. Okay? But God's a healer. And in the midst of struggle, God can refine us through hardship, can heal us and make us better, and even use some of our wounds and burdens in turn then to minister to another person. So uh, if you find yourself in a dark valley, just know God's with you. Um, take God's hand and uh, keep going. Just let God lead you. So healing is possible. That's really good. It's a good reminder um, just of the, the God that we serve mm -hmm. and, and the power uh, of that relationship and being called God's sons and daughters. I think that's really important. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for being here for five good thoughts on pastoral wisdom, on anxiety and depression. I hope that spurs some conversation for you, uh, maybe your family, your congregation, uh, your, your job, wherever it may be. Uh, I hope that these are, are, are concepts that can deepen um, your thoughts uh, about this world because I think it's really important um, just in the era we live in that we're talking about these things. So thank you, Ben. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again on Five Good Thoughts.